Thank you, Pastor Rob. Good morning. Ah, oh, so good to see all of you. I'm so excited to be here this morning. And I am excited because God's doing things in this room today. God's doing things all over this building today. There are spiritual things happening. I'm excited. Those of you online, I hope God's doing spiritual things there. I know he is. So thanks so much for being part of us. I was um, thinking this week about Revelation chapter 7, where it talks about there's coming a day when we're all in heaven, gathered around the throne. And it says there that there are going to be people from every tribe, every nation, every language. We're going to be gathering together, worshiping Jesus. And one of the things we've said as a goal, it's one of the things that we celebrate in this place, is that we are a place that we're beginning to practice that right here on earth, where we're bringing in people from every tribe, nation, um, and language, and we're celebrating together. I was reminded yesterday on a phone call that I was on with... Um, two people that um, originally were from India, um, just what's going on over there right now with COVID and the, the, the health of the people there and the just absolute suffering. And um, w- the one lady I was speaking to, a lady by the name of Lena, who attends our church, she actually was over there visiting family and got, um, that when they closed the border, she's not able to get back to be with her family that's still here. And um, I, was, I was talking with Anand, who is also from there, and his family there is very sick right now. I just thought, man, as a church... And we can't stop and pray for everything all over the world. But man, these are people right within our church and situations going on in our church. I know there's a lot of you that come from that region of the world. So just take a moment. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. We celebrate um, our unity despite where we come from and our language. And we're just so thankful, Lord. Thank you for these that are part of our church. So many people coming from so many different places. We pray for Lena right now. I pray that you'll be able to get her back home. I know she's... Um, applying to get an exception so she can be back to take care of her kids and to be with her husband and be with her family. Um, we pray for a non's family. We pray for healing. Lord, we pray for that country. Lord, I pray that you'll turn things around there like you have here. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we've been in a series on end times. We are in Matthew chapter 24. We are people that look at our Bible and we study it. So if you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 24. Because there in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples answering questions his disciples are asking him. It's in the last week of his life. He's just had an experience in the temple that um, tripped these questions with his disciples. And, and their questions were, um, what, when will these things happen? And what are, what are the signs? And what will be the end of the age? And Jesus was talking with them and giving them answers. And so we have actually walked through this very straight up answer that Jesus had. And by the way, we've done this over a period of, I think it's now four weeks. So we start, stop, start, stop, pick back up. But Jesus was just sitting down having a conversation with him. And so as he sits down, he begins to answer these questions. We're not going to go back and answer those questions right now. If you have a chance, go look at the series that we've had for the last three weeks, and you can, you can listen to some of those answers. But here is the simplest thing that, that I can say to you, is Jesus was giving them answers. And I have heard from people this week, dead serious, we've talked about this a lot. The main discussion still in many of the small groups this week is, so when do you think Jesus is coming back? Like, is it this time or that time? And Jesus is going to say in our message today that you're not going to know. You just don't know. But here is what he says. Be ready now so you can be ready then when he does come back. Because he says, I am coming back. I will return. Look forward to that. Get excited about it. I'm coming back. So be ready now. So you can be ready then. I'm going to say this over and over this morning. I want you to get this into your head. At the end, here's what I want to do is I'm just going to go, how? How can we be ready now so we're ready then? That's something I want to know. It's something you need to know. Jesus is coming back. When? Don't know. Could be very soon. There are things going on right now in our world. Over in Jerusalem, we talked about this last week. The answer to the first question, when will these things be that the disciples asked that we want to know, Jesus tells that there are going to be some Israel, Jerusalem-centric events that include the temple, that when these events start taking place, that's going to begin to um, set into motion a whole series of events that's going to lead right up to the end times. We don't know if the events taking place in Jerusalem today are those events, the things that are happening in Israel. Things like this have happened before in history. But God reminds us, Jesus reminds us in these texts, use these as moments to cause us to step back and say, whoa, this could be the beginning of something. This could be leading to the return of Jesus. 
And um, one of the things I was reminded of this week, Genesis chapter 12, this is something all of us need to know. We live in a world that hates on Israel. I mean, this little country is the size of New Jersey. Anyone know where New Jersey is? It's in the news every day. Countries are just lobbing, lobbing missiles into this country at insane rates. You've seen the videos. A little place like New Jersey, why is it so threatening? And when God spoke about this back in Genesis chapter 12, he says he's going to bless those who bless Israel. He's going to curse those who curse Israel. And so uh, something that we need to know as a church, our worldview must be to be pro-Israel and to pray for Israel. It doesn't mean that they do everything right. They're a secular, godless country today. Many of them are rejecting God. But there are many of them putting their trust in Jesus and turning to Jesus. And the scripture tells us in the end, they are going to turn their eyes and they're going to turn towards Jesus. It's actually the thing in chapter 23 of Matthew that got this whole conversation going. Like, how do we get there? How do we get to that point? In the book of the Psalms, in Psalm 122, verse 6, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So with um, these missiles being shot over Jerusalem right now and the Iron Dome knocking them down, the Word of God tells us we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I thought that would be wise for us to start out this morning by doing. So Lord Jesus, we bring right now... um, these people that you love, that are your people, you said we need to bless them, and that's, that's our heart towards them, and we pray for their safety. It's got to be scary every night just seeing these missiles being lobbed over, and, and Lord God, I pray that you watch over them. I pray that you protect them, and Lord God, I pray that you'd bring them to yourself. I pray that they would respond to you and come in faith to you, and Lord Jesus, I pray that um, as your scripture tells us to pray, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. And if this is the beginning of the end of times, Lord, we are ready. Um, we want to be ready now, so we're ready then. And if this isn't that time, I pray that it'll at least remind us that today's the day to be ready. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so Jesus told us all this information, and then he stopped, and, and he, it's, it's like you and I would do it. He goes, it's sort of like, and then he tells some analogies and some stories and gives a little extra um, color to try to explain what he's trying to say. So let me take you to the first verse where he does that. And it's in verse uh, 32 of Matthew 24. Listen to the words. It says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. This isn't the first time Jesus talks about learning a lesson. Two weeks ago, he says, hey, this whole abomination, desolation thing, <clears throat> if you really want to understand all of it, the thing that starts the great tribulation, you have to go back and study Daniel. So Jesus is constantly telling us, we've told you all this stuff. He's going to tell us over and over in this passage today. You should know this. You need to know this. Now he's telling us, learn the lesson. So here's a lesson. By the way, the lesson's really simple. It's the lesson of the fig tree. Listen to what it says. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts on leaves, you know that summer is near. Not a very complicated lesson. We've just gone through it here. I I sort of got tripped up. You know, all of a sudden I see those first buds coming on the tree. I'm like, yes, winter's over. And then it snowed again. It was frustrating. And then finally it pops and I see them coming out a little bit more. And I think, whoa, summer's here. We had a really nice day or two. And and then the winds blew and it stayed cold. I, I even took some of my indoor trees and put them outside a little too soon. They start dropping their leaves. They think it's fall. But the bottom line, Jesus says, is when you see those leaves popping, you know the season's changing. And I'm so thankful it's summer. And Jesus is using a simple metaphor that we all understand. You don't have to know the Greek language. You don't have to... Now, um, uh, get real complicated about this. Just read what it says. Jesus is saying, so I just told you when you see these things, what things? Well, he just was sitting there chatting with them about. They're like, what do we need to be watching for? And he goes, well, there's going to be birth pangs. That's the first thing. You know, famines, um, rumors of war, pestilence, earthquakes, false Christ. So that's going to be, there's going to be birth pangs. Then he says, there's going to be tribulations. And he says, during that tribulation, which gets started off, because he pointed back to Daniel, with a peace treaty that's made with Israel, stop all this craziness and coming against them. They're going, oh, please, please, we'll sign here. And he says, he's going to start out with that. This Antichrist is going to come in. And as a result of that, a lot of believers in Jesus are going to be martyred. And come the middle of the tribulation, 
something happens. It's called the Great Tribulation, the abomination of desolation. This Antichrist who signed the peace treaty with Israel is going to step into the temple that he allowed them to rebuild, that they're looking forward to rebuilding, that they're ready to build right now. If somehow they could get space on the Temple Mount, they're in there. And they're waiting to build that. He will let them build it. And they will step, he will step in there, middle of the tribulation, in something called the abomination of desolation, and he will desolate that temple. And that sets into motion the great tribulation, I mean, a horrific time of judgment that ends with the return of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying here, learn the lesson of the fig tree. You know, leaves come on, you know, summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, the birth pangs, the tribulation, the great tribulation, the thing we've been talking about for the last three weeks, know that he is near even at the gates and remember they're sitting on the mount of olives they're looking across the valley and across the valley there they see the city of jerusalem they see the temple mount and they see the eastern gate that the scriptures tell us that jesus will come through when he comes in after having come back returned that he just talked about he's going to come through those gates and there he's going to come into jerusalem and set up this thousand year reign of peace we call the millennium that we're looking forward to when Jesus makes um, all things right. He says, listen, this generation will not take place until all these things have taken place. All right, so this generation won't pass away. So the generation that sees the birth pangs, that sees this martyrdom and tribulation, that sees this abomination of desolation, that sees... There, that generation is going to see it all. You start seeing this going on, you're going to get to, to see that. And so, so the seasons are changing. When you see the seasons changing, stop and think. And we'll talk about this just a tad bit more here in a minute. Don't be off put by the fact that we've seen seasons change before. Seasons change. I believe that every time you see these seasons changing, it's on us to turn our eyes towards heaven. So even if some of these things happening in Israel happened many years ago, and our, our ancient relatives many years ago caused them to turn their eyes towards Jesus, Jesus always wants us to be looking forward and looking forward to his return. Re the Bible says there's actually a reward for that, waiting for his return. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you want to look it up. So let's go to, um, to, to this next verse. And as I go to this next verse, let me just say it one more time because I think it's super important. Be ready now so you're ready then. When you see the seasons changing, look inside. We want to know facts. We want to know, when's it coming? When's this all going to happen? Is it starting right now? Maybe. Bottom line, just be ready now so that you're ready then. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But concerning the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father... And I'll stop there. If someone tells you they know when Jesus is returning, Jesus says they don't. They're a false prophet. They're not telling you the truth. And there's no point in listening any further. Jesus says, you don't, I don't. That guy you listen to on TV, he doesn't know when Jesus is returning. What we do know is we know what the signs are. And Jesus is even given a lot of information regarding this, like this abomination of desolation takes place three and a half years into the tribulation and it says how many days there are after that, but we don't know the day or the hour. And then the text says something that's a little bit confusing to many of us. It's like not even the sun knows. And then you get into one of those conversations where it's like, wait a minute, God doesn't know? If Jesus is God, how is it that he doesn't know? And in, in the quick ans asking of that question, we sort of have this way of getting sort of I don't know, confused and scared that, oh, no, I don't know how to defend my faith. It's very simple. Jesus is God. And in the book of Philippians, and if you're taking notes, just, just write down this, this, this verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 says this. He was in the form of God. Did not consider equality with God to, something to be grasped. So Jesus is God. And then, but then it says this. Um, but he emptied himself... By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Jesus takes on humanity. He is fully God. He is fully God, and he is fully man. He takes on humanity, but he limits himself. So 
Him saying, I didn't know that, I don't know that, it's him limiting that so that he can show us that he lived a perfect life so that he could, the next words of this text, go to a cross, become obedient to death on a cross because that was God's plan that Jesus would go to the cross to take the punishment for our sins. He would step in in our place. You just move over, Lee. I got this. He would take my punishment. He would take your punishment for sins. And he would forgive us of our sins. And then he'd place on us the righteousness of God. And the next verse says, and you're going to hear us singing it loud here in just a few minutes when we respond with praise to God. Listen to these words. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So he limited his knowledge while he's on earth. Today, he's seated at the right hand of God. He's ascended into heaven. That's the gospel. And there he knows. He knows everything. Let's keep on reading because the next words are this. As we're in the days of Noah. So now Jesus is going to go, hey, I'm going to take you to a story you know. You know Noah and the ark? Have you heard that? If you haven't, we'd love to study it. I get it. There are people that I meet sometimes in here because we attract a lot of people to this church. They're just trying to figure out Jesus, trying to figure out the Bible, who have never been taught any of this. Totally cool. In the Old Testament, our Bibles, there's a story about a man by the name of Noah. God calls Noah and he says, listen, I'm about to judge the world because of their wickedness. And I'm going to send a flood. That's crazy talk because they had never seen it rain. And God says, I want you to build a boat, gives them exact dimensions, tells them exactly how to do it. It was till the 1800s that we actually had the technology to build a boat of this size with these specifications to realize that that was like the perfect size for stability and all of that kind of stuff. God tells him, here's what I want you to build. He's 500 miles away from any body of water. And he says, listen, I'm going to judge the world. I'm going to come later on. We're going to send this rain. So Noah begins to be a preacher of his age, telling everyone, repent, judgment is coming. And the people look at him, are you kidding me? What do you mean building an ark out here? You're, you're, what are you thinking? That's crazy. In the early days, maybe a few people were like, oh, that's interesting. Keep an eye on that. But years and years go by. In fact, from the time God tells him to do this to the time the flood comes, 120 years. So you could imagine you're 100 years in. You got your grandson with you. God, watching this guy's for years. This little idiot. He's out there building. Listen to him preach. He sees us walking by. Watch. Listen to what he's going to say. He's going to say, repent. God's coming in judgment. Watch. Grandson's like, you kidding me? And they walk by and grandpa's like, you know, in the early days, son, I thought that made some sense. And and nothing's happened. And Jesus says, this was done because God loved them and he didn't want to see any of them die. He didn't want to see any of them perish. So he doesn't just bring judgment and just come upon them. No, he warns them and he tells them, here's what I'm going to do. And the And he allows a guy like Noah to keep on sharing and to keep on exercising his obedience and his faith in God so that people could see it. And even with them seeing it all, they snicker as they walk by. You know, probably eventually, you know, there's even tour groups coming by. Yeah, Noah's Ark. You know, we didn't have one of those until a few years ago in, in America. And they drive by, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. But some may, some may have believed. Listen to these words. He goes, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and they were giving marriage. Everything's fine. Everything's normal. Until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they are unaware until the flood came. And listen to the words. Swept them away. And he says, so will the coming of the Lord be. So take those words, swept away. And you step back and go, ooh, I don't want to be like that. Yeah, is there anything wrong with eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage? No, it's fun. It's the way we live our lives. We live, we have a blessed life and enjoy it. If you're getting married, if you're eating or you're drinking or you got kids getting married, I mean, enjoy your food, enjoy your life. We, we studied, um, the Proverbs here a while ago in Song of Solomon. Solomon says that thing, enjoy this good life we get to live. But be aware, there's a day coming and you better be ready. Be ready today so you are ready then. And Jesus says, these people, 
God keeps on waiting and waiting. And finally, after 120 years, the door goes shut. The floods come up and the people are swept away. And, and in the very next verse, what he says in verse 20, uh, in chapter 24, verse 40, he says, with keeping in mind that whole thing, they were swept away. He says, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. By the way, if, if you grew up in the time I did and you read all the books and watched all the movies about one being taken away and one being left, I, I don't think we were understanding it within the context of this. Jesus just said they were swept away and he's having a conversation with them. He said, by the way, it's just like two people standing there. One's working, the other one's standing there working. And all of a sudden, boom, one gets swept away. One gets swept away into judgment. And, and the other one made the right decision. And he, and he goes on to say this. Listen to these words very carefully. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. There's a lot of things. In fact, maybe after hearing this series of messages for four weeks, you know, at first you're like, whoa, that's good. That's good. That's helpful. It's helpful. And I'm saying, ah, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I've heard this before. I heard this years ago. I heard you preach a series on this and I heard this on TV and nothing ever happens. And yeah, there's more wars and yeah, here we go again. Um, yeah, whatever. Hopefully it'll all work out. And I would just say to you, Jesus, Jesus is saying, stay awake, stay alert. He says over and over this passage, you go through, underline it, highlight it. No, 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 know this stuff. And then he says, stay awake. Here's a stay awake story. So it was Christmas time this year. Maybe two weeks before Christmas, um, when I went out to bring in the trash cans in the morning of the trash service, there was an envelope taped onto the trash can. And I opened it up and there was a Christmas card in there signed by all the guys that pick up our trash. And I thought to myself, that is, that's crazy nice. So I, I just come in and I sort of exclaim, why? well, check this out. These guys are cool. My wife goes, well, we need to give them a Christmas gift. I'm not that smart to know that kind of stuff. It didn't trigger. I thought they were being nice to me. She's like, we ought to give them a Christmas gift. So the next week on Garbage Eve, that's the night before they come to pick it up, <laughs> we celebrate it at our home. It's a big deal. If we don't make it a big deal, I'll forget to put them out. And then I get very upset and it ruins my week. So anyhow, on, on Garbage Eve, my wife has this whole thing prepared and it was really cool looking. I, I don't remember if it was in a bag or what with all the stuff in it. And she's generous. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And I think I, I had some wire in the trash can. So I took it out and I wired it onto the, the trash can. I didn't know that this was going to be something that everyone in the neighborhood celebrated. But pretty soon I'm looking out and all the trash cans have um, a card or something taped or hanging from it. I thought, that is way cool. That is just awesome. Didn't give it any further thought. I did notice that my son didn't come home at normal hour that week, uh, that night. And that's not normally like him. I mean, he's just, he just goes, does his thing, comes home. And he's never been the type to stay out late. But I did notice he wasn't home. I thought that was the oddest thing, right? You, you know when I come in on time. They're laughing up front here. I, I like to get the nod. My son's moving to Phoenix this week. Uh, so I'm like, I got to get one look at him on the front row here because you're going away from me. It makes me all sad. But anyhow, I'll stop. Okay, enough. Okay. <laughs> anyhow, the next morning he's like up. Like I'm like, you know, college students, they stay up all night, but then they sleep all morning. But he's up. He's like, dad, 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 you got to hear what happened. I said, you know what happened? Yeah, I'm like, no, I didn't know what happened. So anyhow, he tells me, he's like, I was coming home and there's these police cars everywhere. And he's like, ah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to watch. So he pulls over and he gets out and he's snooping around. And he's asking questions. He's like, dad, these, these guys that came around and they stole all the cards off the trash cans. Well, then my doorbell starts ringing. It's early in the morning. And um, so I, I throw on a pair of shorts and a shirt real quick. You ever been in that mode? Oh, shoot. Good. Or yes. This lady's standing there. I didn't know her. And, and so I, I said, yeah, yes. 
She goes, um, um, the police were trying to knock on your door this morning. I'm like, why? She said, well, you know, stuff was on your trash can. It was stolen. It was a felony. And they need to know exactly what was on the can and how much money was in the stuff that was there. I'm like, I don't know. Ask her. And so hey, we have this whole conversation. And she's like, I was the one. She goes, I don't sleep well at night. And she goes, I got cameras all around the house. And so every time those cameras get tripped, I'm watching them. You know, normally it's a fox or a, a deer. But tonight it was these guys and they were going and they were pulling off the stuff off the trash cans. And she goes, I called the police and they came out right away and they caught them. And she goes, I am sure glad I stayed awake all night. It's just wonderful. And she stood there and talked to me for an hour. I had never met this lady before. She was one of my neighbors. And we had just this marvelous bonding time describing. And you know what I've decided? Next year on that same garbage eve, I'm going to stay up all night and I'm going to watch. And I'm going to be ready for them this time. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> and Jesus says, well, if, if the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. Jesus thought about garbage Eve before I did. And would not have let his house be broken into my mailbox. Therefore, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming. Oh, he's not talking about the trash. Okay. The son of man is coming in an hour. You do not know. Jesus says, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. I'm coming back. Be ready. Stay awake. Oh, how I wish I had stayed awake that night. <laughs> how I wish I would have thought of this. How I wish someone would have told me. Oh, yeah, they've been having a lot of problem with it. That's what, that's what I heard because the police called me later on that day. They're like, oh, yeah, we've been having a problem with this in a lot of neighborhoods. I'm like, really? What kind of person does this kind of thing? Well, if you know this in advance, you're ready. You set your cameras, you're watching for that to trip, and you're ready to roll. It's an exciting day. Hey, listen, Jesus is coming back. The Bible tells us, watch for his coming. His coming is a grand thing. The Bible even says there is a crown in heaven who, for those who love his return, who, those who love his appearing. By the way, that's 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look it up. Love is returning. Look forward to it. Stay awake. Be ready now so you are ready you're going to get it before I'm done here today. And I'm going to wrap up here real quick. So Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and a wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at proper time? So which ones of us? God's given us an amazing opportunity today to be like Noah was in his time. This ambassador of the message, this ambassador of truth, this ambassador of the gospel to say, Wake up to say, repent, to say judgment is coming. Which one of us are willing to be that one to speak out in this time, to say, stay awake, to tell our Christian friends, to tell our people in our small groups, to tell that person in the office next to us, listen, you can respond now. Now is the time. And he refers to that as a faithful and a wise servant. Blessed is the servant whose master will find doing when he comes, truly I say to you, he'll set him over all the possessions. Whew. See the birth pangs? See stuff going on, earthquakes, and stuff going on in Jerusalem. You start, whoa, something's up here. This is not a time to be sleeping. This is not a time to be ignoring it. Or, or we can be the opposite guy. So I just talked about a wise and faithful servant. Matthew 24, verse 48 says, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed. And if he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect him. So he puts this up and juxtaposes this against a wise servant and a wicked servant. The wicked servant says, yeah, whatever. I heard about this years ago. I, 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 I know that this happened. I like telling the story when we talk about this. I remember as a boy being at my grandma's house the day that Jimmy Carter signed a peace treaty with Israel and Egypt. And I still remember seeing my grandma sitting with her Bible open on the table in the kitchen and tears running down her face. And I went up and I said, Mima, what's wrong? 
He says, nothing's wrong. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He said, well, why are you reading your Bible then? She says, now that these events are starting, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to understand it. He says to know what's going to happen. I believe that was somewhere in the mid-1970s that that happened. It would be very easy for me today to say, yeah, that wasn't the peace treaty. And nothing came of that. It would be easy for me today to say, yeah, the peace stuff that seemed to be signed a few months ago, I don't think that was it. I don't know. But I do know God is trying to get my attention. And he wants me to love his appearing. He wants me to say, like the next to last verse of the New Testament says, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. He wants to offer me that crown of rejoicing in heaven that says I'm looking forward to the return of Jesus. Peter, who was really, really close to Jesus. I'm going to tell you this quick story and then I'm going to wrap it up. Peter, who was really qu- close to Jesus, when he writes about this, he mentions this very tendency that is ours to say, yeah, yeah, whatever. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, again, just write it down. I don't have it up on the screen. It says, knowing this first. So Peter would have been there as this discussion with Jesus was happening. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Sort of like that Noah thing whatever. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And they would deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He is referencing the flood. He sat there with Jesus when Jesus explained all this end stuff. And he's going, hey, listen, when people blow this off, they're forgetting about the flood. They're forgetting about a historical event that happened. And he goes on to say, he says, this is, this is coming again. And he says in verse, um, he says, the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise in verse 9, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Like that 120 years there with Noah. He's just bringing that up again, reframing it so that we can hear it again. Not wishing that any should perish. God does not want you to spend an eternity separated from him. God does not want you to be in judgment. He wants you to be in righteousness. And he says, he wants all to reach repentance. That's what Moses was, pre- under Moses, what Noah was preaching Preaching repentance, that's what we're to be preaching today. And in verse 11, this is what I think is fascinating because I think the question is this. So I'm I'm gonna say over and over, be ready now so you're ready then. We're gonna say this again next week. Be ready now so you're ready then. And I think the question that we should say is like, how do I be ready now so that I'm ready then? And again, we started out with this concept of, oh, when's he coming? What are signs? Are are, are these the signs? Is this what's happening? Is what's happening in Israel right now? Stop, stop, stop. Jesus says, I want you to look inside of you. Don't worry about those details. We gave you the gist of it. You'll know, but I want you to get focused in on the inside. And this is what Peter says. Verse 11 of 2 Peter 3. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? And then he says, in lives of holiness and godliness. And then he says in verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and to be at peace. It took Noah to believe what God had said to build an ark. It took Noah to believe what God had said and have a lot of people laugh at him, make fun of him for building an ark when the rain was coming. No, No rain was coming down. It takes faith for us today to believe that something happened on a cross 2,000 years ago will forgive us of our sins today. And that our believing in that cross will exchange our sinfulness for God's righteousness. It's hard for us to believe that. But even Peter says, I want you to hear this. This flood's a non-contested issue. It's fact. It's historical fact. 
And so when we tell you about a future event of judgment coming, I want you to be ready now so you're ready then. Believe in God. Faith in God has always involved believing what he said. For Noah, it was believing he was going to destroy the world with a flood and he needed to get an ark ready and get on that ark. For us, it's knowing that he's coming again and that we need to put our faith and trust in him so that we can be his children, so we can put our trust in him. If you've never put your trust in Jesus, don't leave here today without doing it. And I just want you to know there have been others this morning who have made that decision. And I'm just like super pumped about that. Because if you just come here and like the coffee and the muffins, I'm glad. But you could leave here having left and gone into a Christless eternity and not ready. We want you to be ready now so you're ready then. This text goes on to say, be ready in holiness. Everything in this world sucks us in. So you may have put your trust in Jesus at a given point, but the scripture talks us to live separate lives from the things of this world. And sometimes there's this one thing in our life where we go, you know that one thing? We actually love that sin more than we love God. We're like, hey, God, God will get over it. I'll still go to heaven. Oh, well, I'm going to do it. And Peter says, after having listened to Jesus, have your lives right in holiness. I'm just going to say this to you this, in this room this morning. I'm guessing that most of us know something in our life that is not right before God. This isn't about works to get ourselves to God. This is about saying, I love you, God, more than my sin. And there's something, as soon as I say that, God's Holy Spirit, especially if you put your trust in him, is bringing something up in your mind and you're going, I don't want to give that up. I don't want to say no to that. I don't want to reject that. I'd be laughed at if I followed God in that. And Peter's saying, be ready now. So you're ready then. Noah believed. Peter says, be without spot or blemish so you can be at peace. This stuff we've been talking about end times is disconcerting. But when our eyes are on Jesus and we're right with him, he gives a peace to each one of us that passes all understanding. I want to invite you to Jesus. I want to invite you to holiness. I want you to invite you to the peace that only God can bring. I want you to say it with me. Be ready now. So you are ready. Let's do it again. Be ready now so we can be ready then. Lord Jesus, I sense there's some people that are trying to make some decisions in this room right now. And I pray that you'll give them the boldness to do the hard thing. They need to repent and turn of sins. They need to come to you. They need to uh, confess their sins. And they need to feel peace that only you can bring. And I pray that they'll find that before they leave this room. I pray that they just won't leave without having dealt with you on that. It's in Jesus' name, amen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite you all to stand up right now. Um, our team's going to just leave you, lead you an amazing Jesus-focused set. I want to invite you to leave your seat and come up here and kneel down and just spend time with Jesus. Uh, the people that are going to do that, they need, they need people to come up and just lay the, your hand on their shoulder and pray with them. Church, it's time to do ministry to, for each other. So I'm just going to invite you to come up as we worship. We're going to, remember, theology leads to doxology. We've heard the truth of the word of God. That's what we do here at Calvary. And now we praise him. And I just want you to do business with him. So I just invite you to come on up here. Don't be embarrassed. Don't hold back. Worship Jesus. Kneel, lift up your hands. Come up here and pray with people that are being prayed with.